What's going on, my fellow reef therapist, Mark Vanderwall? How you been, man? Busy, busy, busy. But yeah, busy is good. It makes the week go by quicker. Yeah, I, don't, I appreciate you carving out some time to uh, host another session with me. Oh, this I think is last week, fun. last week's session on coral coloration, I I have gotten a lot of feedback um, from it through all the different channels, and I think that was a good and important one to to really shift the focus from sheer coloration and hoarding out your corals to how do we make them happy? How do we make them healthy? How do we get them thriving? And I really feel like that's definitely the kind of signature types of topics that we do here on Retherapy. Yeah, I enjoyed that one, except for mispronouncing a word uh, multiple times. But yeah, it was, it was good to get a laugh. and Tell the audience um, right now that I'm off the hook for for you doing that yeah, little intro. Yeah, no, I was embarrassed. I asked you to put that um, intro on there. Just Well, because I, I imagine if somebody was Googling it, they'd be like, what the hell is he talking about, right? So I, I thought, well, if we just preface it with the correction, um, and that's the thing about technical words. I mean, it happens in my work too in, in um, you know, information technology. It's like you have all these different words and uh-huh. um, and now there's like words you're not a, you're not supposed to use anymore. Um, but then my brain still, because I'm old school, wants to use them. And then it's like I catch myself having to use the new word, the new new way to describe a technology. And it's just – I like your explanation happens. of why you put together that preface solely for the sake of the listeners and the viewers to be able to do additional research with the right keyword, right? right. It, w- it was less about being right than, you know, helping the curious down the more accurate path. I think you were confounding chromoproteins with chromatophores, mm-hmm. which are the cells that carry uh, pigments in a lot of higher animals, especially like cep- cephalopods come to mind. Yeah, and – if you do Google that word, I mean, some of the sites I stumbled upon, these labs that actually are um, having, you know, basically programming E. coli bacteria to make these different chromoproteins. And it's it's a fascinating read, you know. So I, I do hope somebody did Google it and start reading up on um, people outside of the hobby that are fascinated by these pigments and how, mm-hmm. you know, it's a form of genetic expression. And, and sometimes you get into the weeds where, where unless you're, you know, you have a background in microbiology or genetics, which I don't, um, I'm more on the macrobiology side, but, um, you know, you, you definitely can get into deep and it goes over your head, but there's still little tidbits that make you think about stuff, you know? So, yeah, um, absolutely. Anyway. But yeah, um, no, I just, you know, I, I just laughed it off and I just assumed uh, somebody would call me out on it. So I figured I'll just call myself out on it. Yeah, first. fair enough. Yeah, so yeah. I'm off the hook. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> mm. um, so we had some really good headlines today on Reef Builders. Um, and just as a notice, if you're very familiar with Reef Therapy, either via YouTube or your favorite podcatcher, which you should subscribe to and rate us and comment on the YouTube videos, um, you know, our, our mothership is ReefBuilders.com, the daily news website. And it's been going for 14, 15 years since 2006, covering all the news. And... Um, I guess we let's get a big one out of the way. Uh, the Radeon Gen 6. Did yeah. you get a chance to read the article? I know it only came out a handful of hours ago. Yeah, I did. Um, I, I don't have any deep thoughts about it other than reading about more of the violet and more of the warm whites. That, mm-hmm. That's music to my ears. Um, mm-hmm. Those would be two things that I wish uh, my... Like I, I have really old hydras, but but a lot of the LED fixtures. Like the one thing I don't like is, um, I guess if you're old school, you like the purpley actinic spectrum a bit more, and then also there's something rich about the warm whites, and then we're even talking about coral pigments last week, and the fact that the pinks and the yellows are starting to be overlooked. I think that's. Hopefully, um, mm-hmm. I'm again. I'm not an expert, but I would imagine warm whites would help in that department. Yeah, um, I don't want to get too much into the G6 because the official announcement is next yeah. week, and by that time, we'll all have had more time to digest it. Uh, but yeah, long story short, um, it will be an upgrade path. It's going to be the same price. It's going to have you know uh, a 
deeper spectrum on top of its original spectrum and a broader uh, spread. And um, I am uh, doing what I can to pull some strings to get the most knowledgeable person about the Radeon uh, as one of our very exclusive, rare guests here on Rift Therapy. Um, so I'm hoping that can come together. But I went uh, yesterday, no, I'm sorry, today's Wednesday, so Monday, I went down to Aquatic Art, which you know very well, Chris Cap in Highlands Ranch, south of Denver, Colorado. He, uh, I went down to go see, he uh, acquired a colony of GFP infected Acropora millipora, first hit the scene just three years ago, and it came from Reef Draft Canada, and it's an Acropora millipora, and I'm pretty sure it's a like a raspberry pink, so not like light pink, not deep red, very raspberry pink Acropora millipora with, um, you know, what is typically called a graft, a color graft, or an infection of green fluorescent protein. And uh, this coral, um, man, the first pieces, I think price has kind of been stuck around a thousand to twelve hundred dollars. They might have been more right um, like three years ago. And some frags have come down in price. But if you get a cheaper frag of Rainbow Splice, I might not have mentioned that. That's the name, the Rainbow Splice Millipora. Um, if, you, it might, if you get a cheaper frag, it might be really small or all green or just a tiny bit of pink because in general the gfp infection is dominant um, in most cases of this kind of color spread throughout corals um, but what was superb about seeing his piece is i've been seeing these at reef shows like aquashella like reef stock and uh you know you see a frag <laughs> you see a single branch freshly cut, not encrusted, and it's like six, eight, nine hundred dollars. You know, it's a good thousand, twelve hundred dollars for a reasonable size frag that is even pink and green. Um, but so he acquired, um, a, so he'd been taking care of this tank. Uh, locally, and the, those people moved, but they were kind of, you know, they had the taste for the upscale, and they had acquired a frag of the uh, Rainbow Splice Millipora two years ago at Reefstock. Two years. They bought a small frag, and then when Chris inherited the whole setup, after taking care of it for years, um, the colony's like five by six inches, and it's like solid green with like this, you know, the raspberry road of branches going down the middle. Oh, my God. It's so cool, man. It is so cool. Pricing aside, yes, I just want to put it out there. If I had that money, I would – I mean, if, if I was going to spend that money – I would much rather get like six or seven small endo colonies of of uh, Acropora millipora. For sure, that is a better use of your money. <laughs> right? What would you do with twelve hundred dollars? Would you buy a frag rainbow splice, or would you buy like ten other corals? Yeah, I, I'm 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 in the camp of that's really cool. But if you gave me twelve hundred dollars, I wouldn't spend it that way. I would definitely buy a bunch of different corals. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm always curious because uh, – so the one thing I enjoyed about that video is um, – I don't know if it was you or Chris mentioned that the the green, the the GFP also impacted the pinks a bit, you know, like – and No, backwards. Or sorry, the pinks impacted the green. But it was almost like an orangey tone in areas. If you just – you know, I took great care – to show that coral off in probably some of the least flattering lighting, right? It was full spectrum, no orange filter, really balanced. And what I'm really trying to achieve then in those cases and basically all my videos is showing a really natural representation of the coral. And then if you should happen to use orange filter or orange glasses and blue out or you know UV up your tank, then you get more color, right? So instead of just doing the kind of like the cover shoot uh, representation of the coral. I'm doing kind of like the everyday driver uh, representation of the coral. But yeah, you're right. Um, the Where the green was kind of spreading th through the pink branches, it's got some depth to it. It's, it. You know, at a certain angle, it's like a little orangey green. Another place is a little bit yellowy green. And if you look at every 
tip, man. There's just like a uh, little pink poking through. And when I first saw the coral, it didn't really scream Acropora millipore to me when I first saw it. Um, but after looking at a few more pictures online, I mean, I'm still convinced it's a Malipora, but I think his colony was just getting blasted by flow. And that's why the branches are so dense. Well, and so that, that whole blending was interesting to me because when you look at like grafted Montes, you know, there's definitely a delineation between the two colors. There's like, there's this mm -hmm. color and then there's that color. Whereas with this Acropora, there's, there's a zone where they blend together a little bit. And again, going back to our conversation last week about this is all genetic expression, right? Gene um, expression. So essentially you're inserting DNA, right? That's uh, that that essentially causes that gene expression to produce the GFP. So it's just interesting to me that you know, like, what's going on at you know the at that layer that we that I don't know about. Maybe somebody that studies uh, um, you know fluorescent proteins and chromo proteins can explain this better. But it's just the fact that there's a zone where both are being expressed versus like. It's either this or that, what you see with like a Montipora. Um, and then the other question I had is, it's, you know, could somebody manually graft two milliporas together and, and potentially achieve the same thing or no? Or would it be more grafted like a Monty where the two don't, don't really actually meet? You know what I mean? Well... Let me, let me throw out my working theory because I feel like this is a great um, kind of add-on to last week's discussion. Um, I think one of the first uh, examples of this kind of uh, transmission of protein happened with a piece that was on reef farmers. I want to say it was an Acropore suharsinoid that was purple with some green streaks. And I don't know if you remember the zeovit.com forum. I don't know. It might still be going. But when that was newer, they opened an expert forum and me and another fella, um, we were the moderators there and we were the only ones that were posting stories. And we had a nice long, long conversation specifically about that coral. And so my working theory, first, you know, grafting is when you match coral, any animal's tissues, right? So we can do a skin graft, but that's tissue mm -hmm. that has to be transplanted across the animal, whatever it is, or the tree. Right. That's a, that's a graft. My working hypothesis for what's going on is not genetic in nature. I believe that the fluorescent protein and, you know, I, I don't know if this have, applies to a, a wide range of different proteins. By and large, it seems to be green fluorescent protein that is most often involved. And I don't, I believe that's probably because GFP is the most common, <laughs> right? It occurs in so many different corals. And um, poslaporids are oftentimes associated with what happens in these cases. And I believe that somehow the protein itself finds its way within the tissues of the corals. And something about the environment allows it to spread throughout the coral, right? So this is, there's precedence for this in the form of prions, right? Do you remember mad cow disease and prions and stuff? Mm -hmm. So prions is just um, like a rogue molecule, like a rogue protein. And if it should so happen to find its way into your brain, it just spreads, and it's very similar to a protein that already exists in the brain, but it's um, I want to say I think I think it's chiral. It's like the the mirror image of that protein, and it, as it spreads through the brain, it kind of turns it too much. So I believe that you know, corals kind of have um, uh, they have to suppress their immune system to a certain degree, in order to allow for the symbiosis it was ozantheli, right? It's literally a controlled infection, but those are inside their cells. So I think there's something about the way a coral, you know, doesn't recognize dinoflagellate as an invader, so it doesn't attack and expel it. And so maybe there's something similar is going on with GFP as a foreign protein that finds a suitable home inside the coral tissue and spreads in this uh, really interesting method. But oh, doesn't for sure. something There's have like, to produce more of it as the coral grows, right? That 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 fluorescent protein. 
That is the limit of my understanding. <laughs> <laughs> I am literally just using prion as an ex as a precedence, as an example. And I don't know. I don't know that answer, but I do know that there's probably like three to five PhD theses involved with what's going on here. I think it could be incredibly huge for like medical research, understanding corals, bleaching, ecology, um, and the symbiosis overall. But someone or three or five different people are going to have to tease apart what's really going on here. You know, if you've been paying attention, just like really talking to people for whom this has occurred, um, I, there's so many times I've heard of like somebody, somebody's bubble tip got shredded. And like months later, oh, look at that. We have little spots of GFP and pink and red or other corals. Or very oftentimes, because Phospholipora damocornis is so prolific, um, it will uh, do a polyp bailout, which is not the same as spawning, but it will just release, you know, these tiny single, you know, multi celled but very tiny um, uh, differentiated polyps that swim around and settle somewhere. You know, you're super familiar with that. Well, one of the places it can settle out in is basically inside a coral, right? I don't know if the coral eats it or if it just hits a coral tissue and burrows into it. But Phospholipora is very often in involved in what's going on here. So it's across coral families from Phospholipora to Acroporids. Um, um, I can think of some other examples where um, somebody's power head fell and kind of blew a bunch of tissue off a green branching damocornis, possible poor damocornis. And just, just kind of like that, you start to see a pattern happen. So I don't know if you, I don't think you could, you know, graft per se, but, uh, I think if you took, some green possible damocornis and you isolated the protein and just sprinkled it on your tank um, that would increase the likelihood that this could occur, you're not going to turn. You know, I don't think it's going to be accepted by euphilias. It's not going to be accepted by clams or ganis, you know. Um, but within Poslaporid and Acroporidae, um, that's where we see most of these um, GFP infections. Interesting. Yeah, that's <laughs> – but to your question, like that is literally the edge of my knowledge. Yeah, I mean there's that – I don't recall the website, but uh, that website that's dedicated to the education and study of uh, chromo and uh, green fluorescent protein, they talk about infections and stuff. And I'll have to do some more reading about it as well because it, it is it, – GFP is like the easiest one or um, – And there's the, not just one kind. Yeah, and it there's has multiple the lowest kinds of green cost. And like that was the other mm. thing that I thought was interesting was like it's the lowest cost to the, I guess the host. But you know, I mean, in terms of like, it, like if you're it's cheap, yeah. Like it's hey, bacteria, here's some mm -hmm. here's some code to make GFP. Like the 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 cost of making it, uh, if I'm reading the article I read last week correctly, was makes it an easier example to use in la laboratory ex uh, experiments for tracing and all that fun stuff than some of the other chromo proteins. So. And um, if some of the viewers and listeners are having a hard time following us, just look at glowfish. Yeah. All those colors that you see in glowfish, which I think are really cool, actually, and kind of an educational tool on genetics and what we're or, talking about. What all about those the, proteins came from something else. Is it axotls or axotols or what do you call them? Those uh, Mexican... No, I no, those are not... Actually, I, I think they know. have GFP ones of those now. Yeah, no, Low I've the seen them ones. before, yeah. but it's, yeah, they must have been, right? They must have been. So we're talking about the uh, neonatal amphibian that doesn't um, metamorphose out of its uh, larval stage. Right. And it looks like a salamander with gills. And uh, yeah, I have seen, I think, what do they call them? Like green phase or something? Um, but yeah, I guess those must have been genetically manipulated. Now that you mention it, it's like I've seen like, axolotls are really popping up. A lot more. To, oh my God! There's a store in the middle of the mountains here. I think it's called Exochi Aquatics. I think I might have even mentioned it before on Reef Therapy. But there's a store up there that just just does that. I'm like, man, you know what? I just want to beeline there as a destination, just see what they got. But now that you mention it, like, man, you know what? Green axolotl, the fluorescent axolotl here with like some real all your, reef all lights. Your lights, yeah. That would be dope, man, with some glowfish too, because when you understand that those proteins were like genetically spliced from completely unrelated animals, it gets a little, you know, uh, island of Dr. Moreau uh, territory. And I think it's actually a great tool. And you know what else? Um, I've always kind of 
subtly appreciated the glowfish. But the other day, I was actually looking at some at uh, you know local kind of chain uh, a court pet store, and they're better. They were looking better. Like the bodies of the fish were better. The fins were better. The saturation of the color throughout was just nicer. Um, I don't ascribe to all of them, you know, like every color of every fish. Like, I don't really care about the tiger barb one. Um, but the white skirt tetras, you know, they got, uh, and some of the danios and yellow, green, pink. The blue is really subtle. The purple is kind of mild. But yeah, so if you don't know what you're talking about, that's what we're talking about. Different types of fluorescent proteins and uh, uh, really awesome kind of follow-up <laughs> to our conversation last <laughs> week. And if you or anyone you know is a specialist in this field, uh, hit us up. We yeah. would love to learn more, even if it's not really related to core research. But if you can help us uh, shine a light on these fluorescent proteins a little bit more, that well, would be really cool. I mean, if you think about the things that they've done with, um, you know, essentially amphibians and fish so far, if these scientists got into the coral coloration business, you know, who knows? <laughs> you know, it's like, Don't give them any ideas. Don't give them any ideas. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, you know, that coral would look, you know, if there was a version of that coral in this color, it's like, mm, okay, give me, give me a few months to figure that one out. So we have enough frags that are going for astronomical prices, but man, now that you mention it, I don't know what would be stopping the the if glowfish. They can make E. coli bacteria express every color of the rainbow. Like I think I sent you that link with the petri dish, and it was like the. Mm -hmm. Do you guys remember Trivial Pursuit, where you got to fit all the slices of colors in, and then you win? Uh, the board game, like that it was, was a, cool, yeah. it was a petri dish that looked like that. It was like like triangular slices of every color you could imagine and i'm thinking why don't they do this with corals i mean soft corals right get some of those doo-doo brown colt corals and make them blue and pink and <laughs> there's our billion dollar idea you're just giving it away i don't care now that you mentioned it, no the reef aquarium hobby has grown so much and so big and they're you know vis-a-vis -vis like lucrative and profitable over the last three decades that's actually totally in the realm of possibility. If they could take a fluorescent protein from a jellyfish, an anemone, and stick it into a completely unrelated vertebrate, you know, a fish and a, a salamander, it seems like it'd be easier for them to, you know, inject it into closely related corals. And it's funny, as soon as you said that, I wasn't even thinking of soft corals. Right, but imagine if your cold coral was blue, and if there's blue cold corals a year from now, this will be on Fa this will be on YouTube, not Facebook, uh, and we will we we can at least point back and say this was our idea. <laughs> you know? What if? All right, I just got goosebumps. <laughs> We're not even close to getting to our like main topic yet, but what if they spliced fluorescent proteins, yellow, green, pink, purple, blue, with the same strain of cold coral, the same lineage. And then you could literally graft different colors of cold coral together. Oh, oh my God. Stop the, stop the show right now. We need to go for him. We need to go pat this idea. <laughs> Ed edit this out until we figure out if it's doable. <laughs> and then it'll be our little secret. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, um, yeah. No, but no, it's not out of the realm of possibility. And this is a really fun follow-up to last week's conversation. Uh, the rainbow splice is expensive. And for all of those chagrined that corals cost so much, just know that any time a coral goes from, you know, for $1,000, a previous coral strain went from 500 to $50. Right. And as soon as something else is in the spotlight last week, or last year or last decades, you know, hype coral is now like just run of the mill. And so, you know, I refuse to spend a thousand dollars on a that coral. Um, I did get a frag from Chris for safekeeping and comparing notes because him and I are just, you know, reefing buddies like that. Um, but I'm, I'm right there with you. I am right there with you at the expensive cost of, of corals. But just know that if the rainbow splice had not been priced at $1,000, it wouldn't be available at all, right? 
if if no one cared like 10 years ago there was a few of these things kind of kicking around but because they there wasn't this market to fuel the intense focused propagation of super unusual valuable strains like the rainbow splice you never heard of them because no one took the time to to intensively culture it and and make it available to a wide range of of reefers Right, so for sure, three to five years from now, you're going to be able to get small colonies of this thing for a hundred and fifty bucks, maybe two hundred bucks for a full-on colony, and frags will be basically free, you know, because they will have moved on to the next GFP or other FP infected coral down the road. Right, so I share people's um, disgust or distaste for overpriced fancy corals like this, but just know. That once upon a time, Sunset Monopora was four hundred dollars for a quarter inch frag, and nowadays you can basically get it for free when someone's traded into the reef shop because no one else wants it. And if you just even ask, they might give it to you if you buy a little frozen food, right? And so you and I have seen this cycle mm -hmm. many times, right? So it's just a matter of time for uh, you know, and by time I mean you know three, five years. You know, where people won't be talking about this coral. We won't be talking about this coral anymore. We'll be talking about the next thing. Yeah, and I think it's – I had this thought the other day about something else, but it's it's relative to this too in the sense that it's all about your mindset. Um, and, you know, you can watch a movie and it can have famous actors in it and you can – you know, it's called suspension of disbelief, right? You can tell your brain like, yeah, I know that's Keanu Reeves and I don't know pick a famous actress uh, but for the purpose of this movie they are these characters and i'm just going to go with that you know and and but deep down your brain knows like especially with famous actors because you've seen them in so many movies that your brain's like i know that person i know that person not personally but you know who you know you know of them um mm -hmm. but you can suspend that disbelief and just enjoy the movie right um the guy from train spotting can be obi-wan right um so that's funny. When you mentioned an actor, I was literally thinking Ethan Hawke. <laughs> Not Ethan Hawke. What's his name? Probably uh, because. What is his name? Oh, uh, my God. I got him confused. Ewan McGregor. Oh, God. You're right. Yeah. Ewan McGregor. Yes, yes. That's who I was thinking, but I was thinking Ethan Hawke, the, the name Ethan Hawke. But that's funny. You were thinking about the same thing because <laughs> I guess we both recently saw the new Star Wars trailers. <laughs> yeah, which I, looks good. Um, and, and another example for me is I uh, many years ago, I went to Egypt before – you know, the um, Arab Spring and, you know, things got a little tense. I think things are good now again there. But uh, and I went and saw the pyramids and, you know, you go see this, you know, one of the greatest wonders of the earth. And there's people just trying to sell you crap the whole time. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there's a there's a pizza hut right by the Sphinx. Right. And you could sit there and let all of that frustrate you and anger you. Or you could just have the mindset of like, OK, I'm going to tune all that out it's the freaking sphinx right it's the pyramids mm -hmm. oh my god 5000 bc holy crap and is I, that how old it is i think it's 3000 uh, bc and 5000 years old no one of the pyramids i think is from 5000 bc okay I, i'm I not gonna google it right but... now so maybe i'll put another <laughs> apology video in front of this one <laughs> no um Anyway, um, but if you just take like what everybody tells you is this super rare coral and it is cool and you really want it and you just take away like the monetary value of everything and just suspend that mindset or disbelief and say, okay, what do I think is cool? What do I think is pretty? You know, there's plenty of cool stuff out there, man. Blue mushrooms are cool as hell. Um, that's not a coral. Uh -huh. I get it. But, you know, same kind of example. Um, so... I don't know, you know, like the whole FOMO thing. I've bought expensive corals, but I like to think that I stumbled into those because I thought they were cool and then I found out the price, right? Mm -hmm. um, jawbreaker mushrooms are really cool. I mean, they are amazingly beautiful in person. And they have been for a dozen years and they still don't grow any faster. Yeah. And demand is far outstripped supply over that entire time and they deserve to be what they cost. Yeah, but blue mushrooms are just as cool, and I have those too, you know? So uh -huh. I think yep. if you just go – it's all about mindset sometimes, I think. I don't know. I, I'm Speaking trying to say mindset. that so I'm not yelling at the clouds as much, you know? Speaking of mindset, I want to give a special shout-out to someone who just recently kind of blew my mind. I received – today, 
I received a large Oronai tilefish. The Oronai tilefish comes from East Africa, Western Indian Ocean. And we were, you know, blessed to share some of the first ever photos of this fish um, alive in the wild, like three years ago. It was described, I don't know, this, it was described this century. So maybe the last 10 or 20 years it was described. I want to say like 2004. But it was like just three years ago that we um, got to see what this coral really looked like outside of the line drawing. And then it was about six months leading up to about a year after that. They started barely trickling into the aquarium trade. I want to say they're coming from Kenya. And I'd never seen one. And today I received one. I nice. didn't ask for it. I didn't pay for it. But Elliot Lim of Marine Collectors, he asked me if I could take this fish and give it a good home. These fish like retail for, I don't know, a thousand bucks. And the reason he sent it to me is because he got a batch of tilefish. Hopefully I'm not getting in trouble with or putting Elliot in any kind of, you know, position or whatever telling a story but he got a batch of tilefish of these or tilefish, tile fish and he had all of them but one sold and he knows from sheer experience that his holding tanks are quarantine tanks right so he's their hypo their copper their treatment whatever the fish needs to really give it a super thorough um quarantine and just total flush his company's marine collectors i should give him at least that little shout out and he knew in his bones that if he just held on to that fish, it would suffer and it would deteriorate and it would likely die if it wasn't put into a medication free full salt environment. And he knew that I'm not going to, I'm not going to be flipping it, you know, and he'll probably get a couple posts and maybe a story out of it or something, you know, yeah. that, that, was, that was not his driving force. His driving force was, okay, I got a batch of tile fish. There's an orphan. Let me put it in good hands. And he was, you know, he brought in another batch, but he had to get rid of that one in order to make room for the next batch. And so today, open up a box. Oh my God, it is fish. I'd seen pictures. Hey, nothing could have prepared me for what I saw in the bag. It looks exactly like a blue spot jawfish, twice as big, <laughs> with a bright white belly. Right. So it's like tan burnt sienna on top, blue spots from, you know, almost to the head, almost to the tail, a little bit of a, you know, kind of bleeds into almost a solid blue line, um, kind of at the mid lateral stripe. And then the belly is bright white. It, like I said, it, it, but it swims around like a, not like a jawfish, like a tawfish, so it swims around. And oh my God, what a freaking awesome fish. Holy crap. Just a beautiful fish. I got him in the fish tank. And here's the thing that's cool. The fish tank is, is dark looking. Right, it's got the black background. It's got no sand. All the ornaments and the bottom are just kind of covered with a dark, just basic biofilm. So the black tang is like invisible, except for like his bluish gray streak above the body and underneath the dorsal fin, yeah. and the bright white tail spine. But this guy, oh my goodness, does he pop, man? He's cool, but I just, I just don't know fishmongers like Elliot who just. Sit he, I mean, he could have flipped that fish for a few hundred bucks. You know, he could have, he, he's in LA. I'm sure he could have found someone, but he's just like, this fish needs to go because if it stays here, it's, it's going to suffer. And instead I'm going to put it in the hands of, you know, my friend Jake and he's going to take care of it and give it a story at the very least. And so, yeah, just, man, I was just kind of blown away by that level of sincerity uh, regarding the health of the fish and what's best for the fish. That is so rare, especially in the aquarium hobby these days when a lot of things is rainbow splice, like how much can I get for it? Or I'm going to spend a thousand dollars on this, grow it out and just keep selling frags for so much. It's the opposite of that. And it was just really awesome and kind of touching to be part of that story. And I just, I really wanted to, inspire the listeners and the viewers to, man, if you've got enough of a coral, don't be that guy on freaking Facebook groups trying to sell a handful of Bam Bam Zoanthids or some GSP or just small cuttings or, or whatever that you're growing really fast for even 10 or $20. Just, just give it to somebody, man. Say, Hey, you know what? 
These frags are free to kids and or new tank. Get somebody in the hobby. You might make a friend. You know, that's really what the hobby is used to be more about, more about the sharing of the information, and sharing of the corals and sharing of the ideas and the, our, our successes and our failures. And I just thought that was a really, really cool um, uh, experience to be part of. And uh, I have not had this fish more than 12 hours. So as soon as therapy is over, I'm beelining over to the fish tank to check them out. Really cool fish, man. Yeah, I remember moving from Colorado to Atlanta, and Colorado was inundated with the SBS bug, right? This was 2000. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that was the era of just, you know, people trading SBS frags, uh, paying it forward. And then I moved to Atlanta, and I went to the local reef club, and nobody had Acropora. Like, nobody in the club. It was all soft corals and stuff and and which surprised me because it's a much larger city than denver was um and you i mean you lived here at that point in time you recall um and so there were like two or three guys that were interested in sbs and you know i became friends with them but um for the rest of the club i just gave away my acros right i just gave them away i wasn't selling them and I was a broke college kid that was, you know, getting his first job out of college, which was, you know, not the I funnest job. I remember your apartment. And yeah. Your bare bones, 75 gallon tank <laughs> yeah. with no flourishes on it whatsoever. I was broke, man. I had student loans. Um, anyway, um, but I still just gave them away because it's, it's not, I, it wasn't a hustle for me. And then literally like two weeks later at the same reef club meetings, those guys had taken my mini colonies that I was giving them and chopped them up and they were selling them. And I was so pissed off. I was just like, all right, this sucks. I'm out. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it, it's, it's such a buzzkill to see that opportunism. I, it's not, I can't blame them, right? It's once it's theirs, it's their choice to do what they want with it. But guess what? I never gave those people free frags ever again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I keep mean, saying, mm -hmm. I'm just agreeing with you so hard to, on this And session. I didn't sell to them either. I just, uh, because I just didn't want to deal with that complexity. And I'm sure some people have come to my house here in Atlanta. I'm, when I do sell something, I'm pretty damn generous about it because mm -hmm. I look at it as like, you're doing me a favor too. You know, like I need to get rid of some of this stuff. So anyway, that done, done preaching, but, um, yeah, that, that's, again, I guess it's, I need to take some of my own advice and just have a mindset about things and just not worry about, you know, that side of the hobby. So anyway, we you haven't know, even I heard, yeah, I heard something, somebody phrase it really well. And maybe he was on a Joe Rogan podcast and they were talking about socialism and the guy said, I'm communist with my family, I'm socialist with my friends, and I'm capitalist with everybody else. And that's just really sunken in with me. It's like, all right, there's three different grades of, you know, sharing and caring or not. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, that uh, sums it up pretty well. But uh, yeah, I think it's time for our main topic, which I Let's think is going to be really, really fun. You ready for this one? Yeah. I like you this one. You got your beer uh, lined up. You got one in the uh, one in the, one bullet in the chamber. Let me refill. All right, so we're going to be talking and comparing um, our reef tanks to natural environments and wild reefs. You know, I think I can speak for Mark and probably a lot of aquarists who started as aquarists and then eventually got to dive and visit some natural reefs that you we all we all have uh, this image in our mind of what a coral reef should look like and what it should be like and what you should encounter there and i think it was vincent you know in one of his talks at reef stock denver and australia 2019 i want to say where he, everybody pictures that postcard from the maldives crystal clear water Nothing but stony corals on a perfect balmy surrounded by white sand, right? So that is this artificial image that people have in their minds of what a coral reef should look like. 
and that's understandable, you know, because the coral reefs of the Great Barrier Reef and the Maldives and the Red Sea make for fantastic diving. Mm -hmm. Crystal clear water, just fields and fields of coral. So those images are the most common. They're the most widespread. But I've always said that bad diving makes for really great corals in a number of ways. And I know that you can relate. So I'd like to kind of break down our comparison, like, you know, water, flow, light, sand and rock, fish, and then just end with the corals, right? Because there's so much more about the environment that's not really being taken into account. And, uh, yeah, I think I, you have some of your own thoughts about that. What was, what was your first experience? I know you've been in Aquarius your whole life. What was it like for you when you got to know the natural environment? Oh, man. Um, so I don't have the – I haven't been to all the places you have, unfortunately. At some point when I started to get into kind of peak dive travel is also when I started to grow a family. And then that really – uh, slow down some of the more exotic travel. You um, should fix that. Well, once they get a little bit older, hell yeah. Um, no, um, so I, I did. I've I did a bunch of snorkeling type younger experiences uh, in the Bahamas, and then in college, I did a coral reef ecology class because who wouldn't, as a reef aquarius, take that class, right? Um, and that class ended with two weeks in Cozumel, so. Not as exotic as some of the other places I've been, but like my first real hardcore diving experience was Cozumel, um, which was a massive eye opener, right? Um, for one, I, I don't know which one you want to get into, light or flow or which one first, but... Water. Okay, well, so... Just, just kind of the water first. So in regards to the water, um, one, there was times of turbidity, but... The thing that anybody that's ever scuba dived Cozumel will comment on is the current, right? It's a drift diving destination. You, I went to Cozumel uh, fall 2020 and no one told me. And I went there and every <laughs> dive was a drift dive. And I was like, damn it, I want to yeah. stop and take pictures of stuff. Oh, there's no stopping. So, yeah, just, so you, just in case you don't know, Cozumel is all drift dives. It's and usually that's by the diving, exception. right? Like you just wave at the coral as you go by. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all, you know, um, yeah, you're, you're totally right. Normally a drift dive is kind of uh, unique and just one of a handful of dives you might do with a, with a group. But yeah, Cozumel is all drift dive. So what was your impression? <laughs> Well, it just um, this was in the this was uh, in the late '90s in the era of uh, reef keeping where we were using Maxijet powerheads for current in our tanks, right? And uh, Iwaki and Mag Drive return pumps, and you're like, oh man, I got some flow in my tank. And then you go dry, dive Cozumel, and you're like, oh, this is flow. You know, I mean, Gorgonians are like laying flat. And then they're laying flat mm -hmm. in the other direction. And, you know, obviously that's not all the time. But um, I, I remember trying to stop and look at something. And I was trying to hold on to some rock that didn't have any coral on it. And, I mean, it was impossible. It was impossible to stay put. Um, and Well, my, my drift drives weren't that as intense. But, yeah, you're totally right that aquarists have this idea of watering each coral. Mm -hmm. Right. Maybe they'll do that with oscillating power ahead or an ocean or a sea swirl. And they're just they want to hit every coral. But that's the ocean. It's what I've always called mass water movement. Mm -hmm. Right. This is what I tried to instill with the introduction of kind of the gyre flow techniques that were enhanced by the gyre flow pump. But it moving all of the water, not here's a jet, here's a jet, here's another jet. Yeah, the, the water flow in the ocean besides the oscillating motion is incomparable. Yeah, I mean, for somebody, and I, I imagine there's landlocked reefers that have never, you know, experienced or witnessed that. So to me, it this is a bad metaphor or example, but it's the closest one you could explain to a landlocked person is um, you hear about people getting swept away in rivers and stuff, you know. Now, a river is more of a persistent flow, whereas, you know, even in Cozumel, the, the currents change directions and stuff. But a good example is just like jumping in one of those rivers and it's just moving, 
you know, and that's even what a, 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 a rapid river that's like two or three feet deep can drown you. Yeah, because it will drag you so hard. It's nothing like wind, you know, like water moving at two to three miles per hour is the same as wind moving about 300 miles per hour just from the sheer inertia of it. Yeah, I remember, um, you know, if you get good at diving and you you get your buoyancy down in a drift dive, you can adjust your, your um, I guess, elevation in the water or how deep you are, right, by in breathing air into your lungs and exhaling. And in Cozumel, I would time my inhales and my exhales. So I would inhale to go over a coral head and then I would exhale to come back down the other side. You know, but true facts right there. I know. I mean, you don't use your fins like you're just you're just enjoying the ride. So um, it really opens your eyes about current uh, for sure when you're talking about water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that's I've been on some drift dives and uh, where you needed a reef hook. Right. So this is a device that's retractable that attaches to one of the D-rings on your BCD and it's just a stainless steel just hook. It's not sharp or barbed or anything. And you can hook in and I remember doing this one dive with Vincent in um, Flores where the corals are amazing. Oh my goodness, the corals are freaking crazy and it was very unique corals. More soft corals, like soft corals need more flow. I'm not talking about leather corals, right? I'm talking about more like the dendronephthias and mm -hmm. more the the more arborescent type of soft corals. But I remember being hooked in, seeing some of the largest colonies of uh, Acropora robusta and humulus and just, you know, really robust ones and looking to my side and seeing a school of antheus swimming as hard as they possibly can <laughs> to stay put. Yeah. Just, just, just flapping, just fluttering as fast as possible to stay in one place. Those are, those are extremes for sure. You have lagoons and you have, you know, places that are a little bit more wave washed. So yeah. Acropora millipora is a great example of a coral that rarely, in my experience, occurs in that kind of flow. It's almost always in the back reef and really shallow water where it's waves. It's all waves. And so you have this oscillatory flow instead of this unidirectional flow. But yeah, like when even to this day, when I see people with too many power heads in the tank or too many outlets in the tank, I, you can tell that they just haven't read stuff beyond 10 years old. You know, they haven't researched mass water movement and moving all of the water. Instead, there's, you know, like, let me turn it to a jacuzzi. <laughs> yeah. And I, that's exactly what I thought of, like a hot some, tub with all the jets, you know. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. yeah. good for and a back massage, but yeah. It takes more planning to engineer and design and put together a water flow system that is going to move all of the water all of the water you have to move the entire cross section if you move half of the water in the tank or even a third by continuity the other portion will move right i did a five-part article you know kind of my debut into real aquarium content back in 2005 2006 um, i think those are advanced aquarists those articles are called flow is more important than light i think it's like 10 or twelve thousand words total maybe more um, so if you really want to read all about flow there's that um, but yeah the, what the water flow on a reef is incomparable and you know don't even get me started on the waves and the real oscillatory motion i'm surprised there's not more wave tanks in the aquarium hobby you know, I still remember when uh, the uh, Tunzies, yeah, the Tunzi Turbel stream. That must have been like Interzoo two thousand two, two thousand four ish, and had this tank that was just moving back and forth. And I was like, "That shit is magic." What's happening in that aquarium, as far as the water going back and forth, is absolute magic. And I think the the second company to follow up on that was Ecotech Marine um, because they had powerful pumps and I just man I went so deep into that oscillation oscillatory motion um, and that's what I did a lot of my research on in college was you know water flow how does that how do water flow affects corals um, so yeah on the reef the water flow is unlike anything that you can really picture unless I think your river analogy is a really good one 
Yeah, and I I like that you brought up the Tunzi Wave box because I think that you know obviously you can do that now with Vortex and um, you can do it even with Tunzi pumps that are not in a box, right? It's all about just synchronizing the pumps properly. But that was the best representation of moving the whole body of water, right? Um, I really mm-hmm. like the gyre pumps. Um, that was a game changer in terms of just having a wide laminar flow. Um, and it's I, I it's funny that I still struggle with flow, right? Even in I'm I'm how how do you struggle with flow, man? You're you're a master at this. What's what's the struggle? Well, well, I guess what I mean is, I mean, I've got a handful of acros and that's about it. I'm not really that hardcore into uh, SPS anymore, but I'm never satisfied with how the flow is set up in my tank. So like, it's like I, it's, it's unachievable still, right? Even with all the technology we have, the corals don't mind, right? I mean, like they're, they're like, you can have a successful tank with the technology that we have today, but I still think it's nowhere close to nature you know i still think there's a a big leap to experiencing a cozumel drift dive and trying to replicate that in a tiny glass box it's probably just laws of physics it's just not possible but um i mean even in this tank down in my basement you know i'm it's like okay spot this spot and this spot are exactly how i want them but then these other corners of the tank are sacrificed right because you have to deflect that flow in a way off of either glass panels or something or angle it at the surface where you you're happy about like how the flow is in this part of the tank but then in this other part of the tank it's not it's either too strong or too little and to me it's an eternal struggle in my opinion okay. and then corals start yeah, well, growing and that just makes everything even harder you know so and i feel like no matter how good your flow is the corals and the scape are always going to create some dead zones. Yeah. And, yeah, and exactly. that's completely the same thing that happens on the reef. That's what creates these microhabitats yeah. where other corals live. Right? All right. So I think we got flow. We got a lot more to get into. Oh, yeah. Um, before we get into light, which I know a lot of people are going to be talking about, I think it's really important to talk about the water itself and kind of like the clarity and I'll tell you, man, there's very few reefs where the water is as clear as your reef tank. <laughs> very few. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. By and large, most of the reefs that you'll see, the closer you are to shore, I mean, you can see it, right? When you, if you're a diver, you, there's, you always ask, like the weather, what's the visibility? Is it 10 meters or 10 feet or, or 50 feet? Or, man, if you got like a 100-foot visibility for a day, wow, holy crap. But, yeah, the visibility – except for the Red Sea, Maldives, and outer Great Barrier Reef, it's quite turbid. It's, it's near one shore, of the metrics that divers notate in their dive logs, right, is visibility. Mm-hmm. So that tells you how variable it is, right? If it was always like the Maldives, there'd be no point in writing down how clear it was, right? But you always hear divers talk about, oh, how was the visibility today? You know, it's, it's, it's like part mm-hmm. of the dive conversation over beers after you're done diving um and that says a lot about the the variability in that uh turbidity yeah no absolutely and in that turbidity that's you know you have nutrients that are bound into small particles you know that's part of the food the plankton and there's just so much stuff there and sometimes you go diving to a place and it's going to be a little bit more hazy at the surface and then clearer down below. Uh, other times, that the surface is clear, and then as you dive, it might get a little bit um, hazier. And that's just wholly dependent on the environment and what the water flow is doing to that particular environment. And by environment, I'm, you know, I'm measuring that in terms of a few football fields, right? Because you get a little bit further, and things might be really different. But I feel like that it's really important to talk about gradients. You know, when we learn about ecology of reef environments, which you took a course, and that was my what my degree was in, is, is you know, you learn about these things about the thermocline, that's temperature gradient, um, the pycnocline, that's going to be your density gradient, and then your halocline, that's going to be your salinity gradient. You know, you've, I'm sure you've been diving and you go deep and it gets a little cooler, but sometimes 
it's like you go from one body of water to another, just just swim through oh, it, and God, the temperature yeah. can change, uh, you know, three to five degrees. Don't even yeah. get me started about those deep um, divers like Pyle and Rocha, the kind of uh, stuff that they must experience. Um, but the, the other thing is, you see fish swimming through it. I was about to say that. You'll you see, see a tang swim right through it. And then you think about the temperature acclimation you do on a fish that you get <laughs> from the fish store. <laughs> and you're like, I just saw tang go from warm water to cold ass water. <laughs> just swim right through this mm-hmm. thermocline, right? And I, I'm i so cold, I'm shivering. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> just, <laughs> again, and the coral you, can't move. Yeah. Coral can't with that. move, right? Yeah. So it, it's a self-acclimating organism, right? Corals, we're just going to say it all the time. That's, that needs to be my next shirt, self-acclimating organism. Which, um, just a real yeah, shout out to move. Richard Pyle in the twilight zone that he dives, knowing how cold it is down mm-hmm. there and seeing him always with like a short sleeve button up shirt and shorts diving. You know, like his buddies mm, yeah. will all be in like hardcore wetsuits, but Richard Pyle is wearing a rebreather with a short sleeve shirt and shorts on. <laughs> it's just yeah. talk about baller, you know, <laughs> just as, Absolutely. Yeah. Man. Anyway. And so a similar thing occurs in shallow water, right? So I have cherry picked corals on the coral farms in Indonesia and elsewhere. And it's so shallow and it's so close to shore that when the tide comes in, it's you know, it's fresh, it's from the ocean, it's clear. And, you know, the corals are just sitting there on their racks. And then when the tide goes out, it's hot. I mean, it is so much hotter and it's turbid because it's bringing all this funk from the shore. And, uh, you know, they're just sitting there experiencing it. You're right. The shallow water corals, they, ex- because they're in shallow water, there's not a huge body of thermal inertia to buffer it. And yeah. they're just exposed to it all yep. the time. Twice a day, four times a day, right? Hot, cold, hot, cold, all the the time. So I've talked about the fetishization of sta- stability in the aquarium and a hobby and in the environment. In some ways, that actually makes your corals a little bit weaker, right? You put them into this bubble where the temperature is always the same, salinity is always the same. Obviously, the chemistry, you know, that's a different conversation. Um, but that's just that's just not what happens in nature. You know, so anytime I see someone acclimating a coral for a, a, any length of time, really, um, I'm just like, man, did you even read a book about where corals come from? Not not just whatever you found online or a video, but it doesn't take too much of a thought experiment to be like, huh, I wonder what happens to corals when they're in shallow water and the tide comes in or goes out. Because it is a massive difference. It really is. Yeah, it is. It's. I mean, I'm sure you'll get to this later in this topic, but the sheer variability, you know, that you see in both temperature and current, but also just locality of corals, it just, yeah, I don't know where we got this idea that, you know, we had to be like the the bubble boy, you know, concept of just perfect everything with these organisms. Um, and, And part of that is, you know, we fail with them and then we blame some parameter or something as to the reason why we're failing and sure there may be something to that right i mean if if you drastically change something quickly you're going to stress the corals out and maybe in a natural environment they have the ability to recover from that stress better than in a captive environment in terms of availability of food nutrients who knows right um but I, we've definitely gone to the other end of the spectrum too, right? I mean, when I get fish in, I always think about scuba diving and I always think about the just massive temperature change, even just snorkeling. Like you dive down 20 feet and you'll just hit a cold spot when you see these fish mm-hmm. running through. And I look at this bagged fish that just came in the mail and I'm more concerned about potential ammonia burn than shocking that fish with pH or with temperature. Right. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'll run that gauntlet, you know, I'll, I'll float the fish for a few minutes, right. And dim the lights. Cause they've been in a blacked out box for 48 to 24 to 48 hours. Um, so, you know, light shock. I mean, it's like pulling you out of your bed and sticking you into a bright ass room, 
but I'm not going to do this like drip acclimation and let him swim around in this ammonia that now is reacting with the room air and turning into, um, you know, and turning into something more toxic that's burning their gills. So, I don't yeah. Know. So, you know, if I bring a fish home from the store, um, it's, it's going in the tank, you know, unless I've had it in the car or whatever for an hour or two, I might give it something small, but like, I am critical or just really paying attention to every time does the the animal need acclimation. I will never acclimate a coral. If people say, oh, what if it's, you know, really hot or really cold? We've said this before. Get it out of there. But for example, when the Ornai tile fish showed up today, I pulled out my pH pen. And pH pen has a temperature. And it was 8.3 and 78 degrees in the fish tank. And it was 7.7 7 and 73 degrees in the bag. So you know, I did drip acclimate it with a you know fast drip for an hour and a half until it got within 0.1 uh, degrees of pH, and uh, what was it? Uh, one one degree of temperature. You know, See, I'm the so opposite. you have to take it on a case by case, right? Yeah. You you if a fish has been packed for a while, um, you know. You, you, do acclimation properly. Don't just mechanically do um, whatever the thing it is you think that you're supposed to do. Um, but uh, but yeah, yeah, our animals are are definitely more resilient than we give them credit for. And you know, you hear about corals bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef a whole lot more than in Indonesia, right? And that's probably because the Barrier Reef is so much more stable that they just cannot handle. Um, uh, you know, these really extreme, these extremes of temperature. And uh, so same thing with uh, in reverse from Indonesia, if um, the corals just are constantly subjected to uh, real differences of environment, um, then they're going to actually be hardier and more s able to uh, acclimate and adapt to those changes in the future. That's a good point. I, I, I agree with that assessment. Um, you ready to talk about light, light in the wild? Yeah, but that might get into get off my lawn zone, but we'll do it. <laughs> well, yeah, we can't talk, you know, we cannot compare the natural versus, you know, artificial environment without talking about light. And for sure in shallow water, you know, it's just so freaking bright, especially if it's clear water, it's incredibly bright. And those ripples just lensing and like focusing the light into these sharp bands like man so if you don't know noon at the equator um on a clear day i think it's about 2200 micromoles you know at sea level um and almost half of that is gone like just from reflection and going through the water but then those lenses they those must be beams of like three to four thousand micromoles just washing over the corals obviously they're they're not held there obviously that coral would just probably you know burn up and just go away uh real quickly if that was the case um uh but but yeah the what the, the, also the light is coming from everywhere it's yeah. not coming from a single point and that's especially true when you consider um, when you go a little bit deeper. The diffraction of the of the water um, it makes the light come from every direction. Yeah, to the point that you don't even know where the surface is sometimes, right? Part of that is the turbidity is that you can't see the surface because of the turbidity, and the other part is that you look left, right, up, down. Well, not down, but left, right, and up, and the the intensity of the light is the same, right? So you 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 can get turned around, especially when you throw in a little bit of uh, nitrogen narcosis in the mix. You can get to a point where you're like, way, which way is up? You know, I mean, obviously follow the bubbles. But um, but then going back to the shallow thing, um, again, it's all about preference. But when people get into these diehard arguments about the color of lighting or the spectrum of lighting on reefs, I don't get it, right? Because it all really depends. Um, the thing that, the reason why I probably have my lights more on the wider spectrum is because of my snorkeling and diving experiences. The thing that I'm most nostalgic about is shallow reefs, right? And shallow reefs can have every type of coral that you can imagine. It's not just light-loving corals that you attribute to SPS, right? 
leathers love light too. Um, Gorgonians love light. And going back to diving, uh, I've been on a bunch of dives, not as many as you, but um, out of the 70 or so dives I've done, maybe more, I don't know how many I've done. Um, the mo- One of the most nostalgic and memorable ones I ever did was uh, I, it was a beach dive and I went and I grabbed a scuba tank and I went into about 15 feet of water and I sat right in front of in the sand. I just I I, I uh, deflated my vest so that I, you know, had negative buoyancy. And I sat in the sand in front of a giant coral bommy. And I just waited for the noise to settle. Right, like they were all every little organism was spooked that I showed up. And then I just sat there. And uh, a scuba tank goes a long way in 14 feet of water. Oh my goodness! Was that like a two and a half hour dive? Not I, that know. long, but I I. I sat there for probably at least 45 minutes to an hour and just watched this coral bomb me like it was somebody's fish tank in their living room at 14 feet, just sitting there, you know, with my air deflated out of my BCD and just, you know, the fish got more comfortable with my presence and the cleaning station resumed and life just went on. And it was, you know, for anyone, again, that's landlocked, Go to your neighborhood or your backyard if you're lucky, swimming pool, and go like you know, blow all the air out of your lungs and sit in the deep end of your swimming pool. It's not blue; it's white light, right? It's it's more closer to the daylight spectrum. There is some filtering happening to certain wavelengths, but it was just like the glimmer lines that you see at the bottom of a swimming pool hitting this coral bomb. It was the most beautiful thing, man. I just sat there and just watched it for a while, just like you would watch your reef tank. So. That's what I'm nostalgic about. That's what I want to replicate in my tank. So why I'm attracted to point source lighting, right? To create that glimmer lines. That's why I'm attracted to whiter light. That's I, why you love those Kessel 500s with a narrow yeah. angle reflector. <laughs> right. Um, you know, that's what I'm chasing. Like that, that memory, that dive, you know, and I, you should not dive alone. You should always dive with a buddy. So don't do what I do or what I did, you know, but I just went by myself and I sat there. I mean, I was, I was very close to the beach, right? Like if anything had gone wrong, I was in swimming pool depth of water. You so take your gear off and swim up. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, you know, cause every, for people who dive, it's like you get on the cattle boat. Okay. You dive here, dear, dear, boom, 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 you know, and it's like, go, 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 go. It was fun at one of these resorts where there's a reef right off the shore. To just a house sit, reef? Yeah. Just sit on the bottom for an hour. <laughs> just watch mm-hmm. the light. Anyway, that's, that's, that's my opinion about light in a sense that I've done 160-foot dives. And yes, things get bluer there, right? But um, again, the variability. There's, it's not like old corals only exist at this, this depth and this light level right it's all over the spectrum so why argue about it you know on on some shallow reefs i have been really surprised as an aquarist to see in like basically snorkeling depth samacora pavona cyphastria you know these corals that in our aquariums you just you wouldn't expose them to aggro levels of lighting intensity and yet on a super shallow reef man like if it's if it's well wave washed and diverse oh my goodness it's just there's i mean all right you're not going to find most pectinia in that that shallow of water you're not going right. to find some naked acros in that water but they you know, corals don't follow the same rules that we do and you know, so we've talked about the shallows for a little bit. And so if you go a little bit deeper, that light is literally coming from every direction, mm-hmm. right? Even in clear water, the diffraction from the water causes the light to point in every single direction. So I do appreciate this increased um, awareness of, uh, of spread um, over the whole tank, but it's not just of covering the whole tank. It's also about getting more light beams coming from every direction. Yeah, I think that's true for shallow too, right? Because there's light that there's there's light refraction happening in the sky as well, right? It's not all coming from the sun. Oh yeah, it's not, it's not exclusive, but yeah. it's really noticeable when you crack 50, 60 yeah. feet, um even shallower when the water's turbid. Agreed. Yeah. And you can look in like a hole in the reef and there's corals growing in the hole. 
to never experience direct light. It's all just light coming from the entire ocean, that the whole body of water around them is scattering some light in their direction. So while it's cool to see the conversation about lighting get, you know, put a lot, some emphasis on spread and covering the whole tank, it's, to me, it's also about overlap, right? So unless you're growing monopores and it's a super flat plate or certain chalices and disc corals, um, Acros and all the SPSs that we love, they're three-dimensional for a reason. They are a light-gathering engine, and they need it from every direction. That's, that's, that's really, really important. But also, I'm, I'm just as surprised at the low-light corals that can handle very, very shallow water with very bright light as I am with certain species of acros just looking super tight and thick in shallow water and then loosening it up at about mid depth of 30 to 45 feet. And then sometimes you'll find that exact same species all the way down to 60, 70 feet. And it just grows totally differently, just totally splayed out. But when you dive, you can see the gradient in the morphology, the shape of the coral colony from the shallows to the depth. And this, it'll be the same exact color of that coral on a single dive. And you see just how variable and how adaptable that coral is. Yeah, I did. I remember doing a 45 meter dive uh, in the Indian Ocean. And my expectation for what kind of corals I would see was completely altered, right? It was completely a surprise. Like it was, um, I remember seeing, I, I couldn't tell you what species of acropora it is. It reminded me of like an acropora solitariensis where the branches would refuse with themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And it was definitely um, a tabling acro. Um, but I mean, what? how many feet? That's like 135 feet. Right, a forty-five meter dive. I think I'm doing the math right on that. Um, I think you're close enough. Yeah. So imagine going 135 feet down and finding acropora, and we're not talking about deep water acros, right? We're talking about a tabling acro. Um, Wait, you dove over 100 feet in Mozambique? Yes, on nitrox. Really? Because I did diving in Mozambique too. But it was like bottomed out at like 60 feet. You know, I got to see lots of gem tangs tiger angelfish yeah but almost no coral you must have been further north than i was because where i was it was like rocky reef with a few Wait, were you in mozambique or south africa oh, i'm sorry i'm sorry you're right yeah i was in south africa kwazulu natal yeah so i dove there and that's way more temperate but then as you go north into mozambique it's about like a i don't know three four hour drive Mm -hmm. uh, it definitely starts to get more tropical but it is still subtropical right it ain't the red sea it ain't kenya it's, right. um, but you start to see like these massive leather corals, like they're flat and they're just spread out. And then, yeah, the you know, Acropora showed up. Um, but yeah, there were some good deep dives there that, um, blew my mind in terms of just seeing Acropora that deep. Um, and it was great because you would go, you know, beside them and look underneath and they just be like two feet off the substrate. So like the the pedestal of this tabling acro is very short and yet the tabling was I don't know 12 15 feet just and you're like how does that not just crack right like how does that not just break with a big storm but I guess sometimes that depth, it does yeah that's true some not not with that depth but sometimes it does because I know me and a couple coral diving buddies have definitely uh flipped and and relocated Fixed. like a you know a six eight foot acro that just fell over. That is actually kind of cool when you're diving as a reef aquarist. You feel the need to be a reef aquarist. <laughs> I need to pull this algae off of that coral. I need to move that piece of rubble that's fallen on top of this elephant skin. I need to just separate this or waft away some of the sand that's piling up on this, you know, stagnant part of the coral. That is one of the one things that I do love about a reef being <laughs> a, a reef aquarist. When you're diving, you feel that that instinct to make things better when you're there. I've just done shy that. of, you know, like fragging stuff up and making a better shape. But yeah, you want to flip a coral, make it, a, you know, put it back where it was or, you know, something like that. That's kind of cool. I like that. 
Yeah, I've taken some storm damaged corals where they've, you know, they're upside down and you put them right side up and yeah, it's probably a lost cause, but you're like, yeah, okay, I'll put that back where it, where it was, you know? So I'll feel better because, because of it. Um, cool. So I think what quick one that we can really get out of the way is sand. People, again, they have this image in their mind of the Maldives or the Red Sea or the outer Great Barrier Reef with sand in the front of the picture. And I'll tell you what, man, like corals grow on rocks, man. They grow on rocks. They grow on hard substrate. They, corals grow on top of corals that grew on top of corals for generations. And the sand zone is over there. It's doing something else. If there's sand, that literally means there's, that there's not coral, right? There is a inverse correlation between coral abundance and the prevalence of sand. Okay, yes, sir. A few corals are adapted to move around in the sand, like walking dendros, or grow out of the sand, like dendronephias that will actually have like root-like branches to attach to the sand. But that's the exception by by far, right? So if you're diving around sand, the corals are in another area. So this, uh, dude, dude, I wish I could, I, I would love to just put sand in all my tanks bright white sparkling sand in all my tanks to brighten everything up and to increase the reflection from the light going up and just give it that framing that makes it get the gives it that look but you know in the steve weiss conversation he approached it in such a way that he knew the liability that the sand caused Right. I think he's the only reefer I've ever talked to who's like, yeah, sand is the worst. That's why I spend a number of hours every week maintaining it. And I don't put corals in the sand. The sand coral, you know, corals go on the rocks. And that was just such a fresh breath air. That was therapeutic for me <laughs> to hear it from someone else. And so, you know, people were like, oh, yeah, you know, sand bed in the ocean. Like, yeah, okay, sure, there's huge sand zones, but those are separate from the reef zones. Although, there's some really cool fish in the sand, right? Sleeper gobies and jawfish and razor wrasses. Those are really cool, but that's not what we're talking about. No, I agree. I, I'm a person that does use sand and I like sand, but I don't sit here and argue the benefits of sand because I don't really think the benefits are there. You could talk about it being a habitat for um, microorganisms, right? Uh, that might indirectly benefit your tank, but... I think that's like a weak argument. It's sort of like, you know, I kind of laugh at all. Uh, like right now you got all these companies arguing like, hey, come back to the corporate office because collaboration is really beneficial in person. I'm like, yeah, it's kind of a weak argument to all the benefits of working from home, right? In terms of carbon footprint, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, sitting in traffic for two hours a day. Um, so when, when I... I used to be a believer in the Joe Barrett and the deep sand back in the day. And now that I've had bare bottom tanks, I see sand as more of a liability, but it's a liability that I'm willing to endure because I like sand. And that's what I liked about Steve Weiss is it's the same thing. For him, it was an aesthetic, but he understood that it was also a liability that he had to address and take care of. Um, so I agree with you. And then when you're diving... Uh, I mean, again, something that I'm nostalgic about is these, I call them coral bombies. That's, I think, more of an Australian term, maybe. But um, these these rock islands of coral, and sometimes you do these dives where there's just vast sand beds, and you're diving across them from one bommy or rock island to another. But that's the only place where the corals are. The sand is like a, I don't want to call it a desert because it's very biodiverse, but um, you know, you've got your, like the organisms you just talked it about, is, got, but it's not a, it's it is not, a death trap for corals, right? Yeah. If corals fall off the reef into the sand, you will find those skeletons or that dying coral. Yeah. Right. Because they're going to get rolled but, you know, around in that current lines, we talked about too, right? I mean, they need. They're literally going to get sand blasted, <laughs> sand tumbled, <laughs> yeah, sand buried, like everything you, you know, you can think of. Um, but and the, the other thing, thing about sand is like, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say the other thing about sand is, again, for people that dive, you know, you get pissed off at the guy on the boat who kicks up all the sand with his fins because it makes the water mucky. It's not clean stuff, right? It's not pristine Red Sea Maldives sand, right? It's 
it's just full of crap. And you get annoyed by the guy who's like a crappy diver who's kicking up all the sand. <laughs> so as, as an aside, usually it's that guy who's talking the most schmack on the on on the boat because he's taken all these different certification courses and he's got all the scuba pro gear and all these bells and whistles, but he's not watching his fins when he's swimming around. But yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm still waiting to see that setup where someone starts it out with the rock and the corals. And adds the sand later. Yeah. Right? I see all these reef tank builds where people almost start with the sand. They do their scape or they put their sand in and then they do their scape and then put the sand in. And it's just that instant gratification. But there is a middle ground between having no sand and having a sand bed. And for me, it's like, yeah, wait three, six months for your tank to be mature and then slowly add sand. Right? When people decide that they don't want to do a sand bed. They do it slowly. They slowly remove a, you know, a quarter to a half inch or just one side and work their way across. But same thing, I feel like if you're going to have sand, all reef tanks should start out without it. And then you can slowly add it in just enough to kind of cover the ground. But when you start out with this big sand layer with this misguided romantic idea that somehow it's going to buffer your water. We talked about this already, mm -hmm. right? When we covered um, Moe's Marine Aquarium reference mm -hmm. and when the buffering capacity of sand is just gone after one year and you see these people start out their, their tank with the sand. I'm just like, oh, your tank is going to be cloudy for like three or four days just because you had to have the sand on day one. All right, I think that's enough uh, dissection of the sand. Um, but before we dive in, you know, kind of the main event, I think we've talked at length about the prevalence of a diverse group of herbivorous fish to help control the algae. That is, you and I are in agreement that that is like 90% of your algae management is from the herbivory that happens. Um, but the other growths that just don't get talked about in the aquarium yeah. hobby at all, right? You, you, you dive a... Any an average reef, it's got like layers of sponge and colonies of sea squirts, and you know real nasty hydroids that look very coral-like but will sting you wherever you're not covered up, and then stylaster, lace coral, and just everything you can think of. If the corals aren't grown right next to each other and just you know nearly 100 cover, there's something else growing there. Well, there's, and. Not only that, but that hard substrate that all these corals are growing on, it's covered in detritus. I, I, I mean, I don't know if it's truly detritus, but it's covered in that, that, muck. That depends on the environment. I, well, it depends yeah. on the environment. In some places, yes. Even with great flow and full-on acros, I wouldn't call it detritus per se, but there is a organic biofilm that is trapping yeah. some degree of detritus. There is so much in between the corals. It's never that super bare, clean rock, unless you're really, really far from shore. I'm thinking, you know, very isolated Pacific islands that just have no pterogenous input coming from streams or forests or rivers where coralline can really dominate. Um, but yeah, by and large... There's there's a, a layer of biofilm and detritus capturing. I wouldn't call it detritus per se because, you know, like fish and stuff. Will, but there's something growing there that you can't well, put your I name. Just you mean can't like if you name what it is. Rub your fingers on that bare substrate in between two corals. Like a bunch of crap will get, you know, will get rubbed out into the water from you like tinkering with it, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I mean, I haven't been to all the places that you've been so maybe some of my observations are more localized but i've seen valonia i've seen calerp on a reef i've seen turf algae on a reef i've seen cyanobacteria on a reef like patches of i don't maroon. think i've never not seen cyano right it's all there you'll find there's somewhere you will find it yeah you know if you stay in the really picturesque place whatever but if you're really scanning the reef you're absolutely gonna find some little patches of cyano and so i don't really think twice about cyano my reef tanks it's seasonal it's localized you know yeah do the freshwater aquarists have it much harder when it comes to cyano their cyano is like a deep green that will cover and smother everything the blue green and stuff is that what you're talking yeah. about yeah mm, it's been a really long time since i've seen a, a marine aquarium that had just like 
a significant amount of cyanoalgae growth. I just thought of another animal that grows in between corals, bryozoan, moth yeah, animals. Yeah, the bryozoans. Not even part of the conversation, right? But it's a huge phylum mm. of organisms that go along with sponges and the hydroids. Uh, rams, those are... Um, I guess they're single cells that will form some some micro colonies. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So there's just so much more growing in between the corals. Um, you got anything else uh, you want to mention about natural reefs before we actually talk about the coral? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, one that I think is um, is often overlooked is fish size. Um, you get used to seeing fish. Um, sized by aquarium shop sizes, right? Like you go into an aquarium store and there's a range of sizes that you see for a fish. And part of that is that they only collect certain, these fish at certain sizes mostly, right? Like they're preferable sizes. Um, the other thing is that these fish don't attain their full growth in an aquarium, um, typically. So it's... I think the thing about diving that was that's a huge shock to your system is seeing some of these pet fish in the wild and seeing the capacity they have to grow and how big they can get. Um, a lot, it first started, you know, obviously Caribbean is the easiest reef to go dive, right? And seeing queen angels that were just freaking immense, right? I Big mean, enough to feed a small family? Yeah. And then, you know, as I ventured further, seeing emperor angels that were like, at, I mean, they're like this. Big enough to feed a small village? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're fat. Like, like when you're looking at them face to face, like their girth is insane. It's like, a, it makes a... a a striper or like a small mouth or large mouth bass looks small. You know, like these yeah. things are no, beasts. You're, you're totally right. The th I think the thing that strikes me the most is, I mean, what's made for popular and, and does, you know, in demand aquarium fish has filtered down the diversity of fish that we get from any given reef to like oh, 5%. Yeah. Damselfish, wrasses, tang, some angels, some butterflies, a few odds and ends, but you don't have triple fins in the aquarium hobby. You don't have um, goatfish. Okay, goatfish, yeah, you'll see some, but they don't really survive, but you'll see a bunch of goatfish. A ton of eels and predators and groupers. Um, there's reasons, you know, we don't have those in our reef tanks. Um, all kinds of cardinal fish. And sweepers oh, yeah, and sweepers smaller cool. sort of sensitive things that maybe don't have a really long lifespan. But like cardinal fish are some of the most common fish on like all kinds of reefs. And sweepers are kind of an analog in a different family. Um, what are some other examples? Um, huge diversity of wrasses. You know, it's not just fairies and flashers and choruses and helicorieries. Um, you know, sling jaws and a lot of the nano fish. So many small nano fish. I mean, a lot of them are gobies. Some of them are, are, are blennies. Uh, we got the triple fins I mentioned earlier. What are some other things that you can that you can think of? Well, there's that whole genre of fish that we are considered not reef safe, right? But then you go oh, scuba yeah. diving and they're they're all there because, you know, yeah, they, you know, obviously like butterfly fish, you know, you see them cruising the reef and doing their pecking and yeah, in your 120 gallon tank, they would wreak havoc perhaps. Um, but on a, on a reef, it's not a problem. I mean, do some eye tanks. Like once you see those in the wild, you're like, why on earth do we bring those in? I mean, not to, I'm not trying to offend anybody those... that enjoy keeping them. More power to you. But like when you see a Ducemurai in the wild, it makes the naso tangs swimming next to them look tiny. You know, it's like yeah. they're huge. No, that's the, that is that's a that's a really good point. You know, some of these acanthurus that you can find in the aquarium hobby, and I'm thinking Macaulayseps, Ducemurai. Um, uh, Xanthopterus, the yellow fin. I mean, there's a ton of them. And then even oddball nasos, uh, that you don't really, 
when they're even six inches long, it's, sometimes it's hard to tell them apart. When you see them like full grown adults, there is no mistaking them. <laughs> oh, yeah. For one for the other, you know, Leucochilus, uh, Tenenti, uh, Orange Shoulders. They, when they're big and large and mature and really showing their uh, adult coloration, they don't look like each other at all. <laughs> but no. when you see them in the aquarium store and they're like four, five, six inches, it's like, is that a Xanthopterus or is that a Dusamira? I'm not super sure. And you have to look really, really close. But in the wild, it's a whole different story. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I don't want to... I don't want to make anybody feel bad about killing fish, but like if you spear fish to do samurai, you'd be like a full grown one. That'd be like an epic picture. I mean, those things are freaking huge. I was I was shocked by that. Like it just just never crossed my radar because I always thought about like the naso genus as being like, mm, you know, is a one eighty really big enough for a naso long term, right? And then you see these. The answer is no. Yeah, but then <laughs> the you see these no. a- a- acantharis, and you're like. Oh, but did you see what just swam by? Like, dear God, like Godzilla just swam by and it's a tang, you know? So anyway. One thing that always kind of surprises me is how many pipefish and seahorses you can find on a reef. Oh, yeah. More on the pipefish side. Um, but you're just like looking at a pipefish and like, you shouldn't be here. Right? You're looking at a wild fish in a natural environment and thinking in your head, your aquaristic filter is like, that fish doesn't belong here. But yeah, on the reef, like... These pipe fish and, and like pipe horses and even seahorses, they're just cruising and hanging on to whatever, usually on the edge of the reef. You know, the seahorse yeah. is going to be closer to the sand zone and more in the gorgonians and algae patches. But pipe fish, man, they're all up in it. And uh, I have followed around some like dragon face pipe fish just inches away from my mask. And as long as you don't make too much sudden mo- motion, you can be within a foot and just looking at it super close. And it it just goes around and picks and packs and picks and packs. And the other thing is the fish you don't see. Do you know how hard it is to spot a mandarin out in the wild? You will not see that fish. I've seen it once before, uh, maybe once or twice, but it's specifically a spawning specifically at spawning and uh mandarin um you know it's got this crazy psychedelic color pattern but they live amongst the branches of usually shallow water parietes and inside the parietes is actually dead so that you got four or five inches of live coral and then inside and kind of around it's just like coralline algae and i'll tell you what man when those mandarins are in there they're really hard to spot, but you will not see a mandarin just kind of casually swimming around on a reef like we do in our tanks. Like that is a incredibly special thing to have a mandarin that is comfortable in your reef tank swimming around. Because when you go diving, you will never see that fish unless you specific lo- specifically go to a spot where guides tell you you can find it. And then you have to wait for spawning when they come out um, or start become a little bit more active right at dawn before they spawn. I, speaking of that, um, the, the commonality of some fish in the trade and the scarcity of seeing them diving and also seeing how uh, shy they are. I've, like the first time I saw a firefish, diving i was like how the hell do they catch those things because it's just like sitting outside it's swimming outside its hole and the minute it saw me it darted into its hole you know um i've got mm-hmm. one blurry picture of a firefish <laughs> um a dotty backs right i mean you'll run into those guys occasionally like if you're paying attention but again how the hell do they catch those things i don't know i i I've... It, it is astounding and in some conversations with bob fenner i do remember him telling me of how like a uh, rainford igobies impossible to catch you know the white guys would go out there and they just could not scoop them up and then something about um you know the locals would just take a fish net and just kind of put it in the sand and shake it back and forth a little bit until it was slightly covered with sand and they waited for the fish to swim above it and then they just pick up their net you know, so probably a similar thing with the firefish. There's a technique for every one of these fish, yeah. but definitely, you know, the fish that we keep are not a real representation of what you see when you're diving on the reef. The fish are much bigger, so much more diversities, and then kind of cryptic, semi cryptic fish like mandarins and dotty backs um, are overrepresented 
in the aquarium hobby versus a natural reef. And I just, you know, that's, this, I really hope that people listening right now will, uh, after, if they're listening, watching their tank right now, or when they look at their tank later, will look at everything with kind of a different perspective, especially in regards to the fish and be like, okay, the, if, if I went diving, I would almost never see a mandarin or, and I would not see a fine Adati back unless I went to the right place at the right depth. Well, yeah. in, in, in the you know grand scheme of appreciating your tank and ha putting a different lens on it by taking up snorkeling or diving, like, you know, we talked about burnout a few weeks ago and, I, and, and one of the suggestions, I may have said it or maybe we ran out of time, is go take your family or your girlfriend or whatever on vacation to some tropical place where there's coral reefs and go on some snorkel tours. It, it would definitely help your burnout, right? It would it would reinvigorate your passion for this environment that you're trying to replicate in your home. But um, even just, um, you know, getting more granular than that, um, go try to follow a pygmy angel around on a reef, right? Like a flame angel or That's a potter's such angel a good in Hawaii. Suggestion. It's hard. Those you, fish are so much more bold than you'd think. Yeah, and there's but, a reason that tangs, certain tangs, mimic them. You know, they have their spines on their gills, which makes them really hard for predators to swallow. And when you're diving, and you are, you know, six foot, couple hundred pound human with all your equipment, and you see this, you know, three, four inch, you know, angelfish swimming around and surprisingly undisturbed, you know, by and large by your presence, you're like, man, that fish has got some spunk. He knows, he knows he can just dive in anywhere. He knows that reef or he or she like like nothing, right? He knows every hidey hole he can go into. And if you just follow that guy around, trust me, you'll go back to your tank and you'll look at your flame angel in your tank and you'll have a whole other idea of this fish beyond your experience buying that guy at a fish store. Like see, seeing, seeing the things that you keep in the wild and just having that perspective really enriches your appreciation. More so than spending twelve hundred dollars on a coral. <laughs> so you are so right in this. I feel like this this is really applicable to what you were talking about the holiness of the rock, right? Some of our rocks have just gotten. Um, I'm talking about the macro porosity, not the micro porosity, but a lot of our rocks have just gotten dense. Wild rock has a just plethora of of holes and crevices of all different size sizes. Right, so when you dive in a natural reef, you have no idea where that fish is going to pop into the reef or where it's going to pop out. Right, so if you're using, you know, some of this man-made rock that has this micro porosity, and the fish can't go in it, can't really go in it, like wild rock or like a wild reef, you're missing out on some of that behavior. Yeah, when I had that NSA negative space aquascape, you know, I noticed the behavior with my flame angel was different, you know, and I noticed that he was very territorial, very aggressive. Um, and it just, it was like a lot of drama with him and some of the other fish. And then um, indirectly, you know, I didn't do it because of that. I tore down some of that NSA aquascape and just created a boring pile of rocks. And the first thing I noticed after doing that was that that flame angel almost like the Elon Musk tunnels that he wants to build in LA. Like this fish figured out tunnels. And so he figured out a way to weave through the tank and not always be exposed, right? And so he would leverage these tunnels to go from right to left and left to right um, so that he wasn't always exposed. And it was fascinating to see that shift in behavior. As soon as I created nooks and crannies, that fish took advantage of them, you know? And and again, if you go snorkeling or diving and you've observed uh, a pygmy angel behave that way, you know, like he knows his little tunnels to get away from you. And then seeing that in your tank, it's very enriching and rewarding. And then it kills any argument for some stupid amoeba aquascape, you know, because you're like, well, yeah, but I don't the know. The balloon if, animals. The balloon yeah. animals aquascape. I don't yeah, know if he's so, if my so flame good. angel's happier, right? I don't want to assign. I don't want to anthropomorphize Actually, the you fish. Do. But it, I'm going to push you to do that because you see the behavior, you see the look in his eye, you see how much more jerky it is. Yeah, you know, it comes out of a rock and it's kind of looking around, looking at you, and its tail is kind of like flapping back and forth, and then like that distinctive way. And uh, if you've been diving, or you don't even have to go diving. 
you guys, you know, I know this is, that's kind of an exclusive experience, but just go on YouTube and look for like dive videos where someone's more casually going along the reef, not chasing the sharks or the sea turtles or looking at super macro stuff. If you can find just any random video um, of someone just casually cruising on a reef or Bruce Carlson's videos where he sets up a tripod and just lets it chill for five to 20 minutes, yeah. you could see the behavior of the fish, you know, obviously when you're. Uh, diving, you're immersed in it, um, but you can you know throw this up on your big screen at any time and just you know trawl a couple videos and see this kind of behavior. But yeah, that's just kind of that's one of the conversations that is completely absent when you just have these online discussions and it's completely removed from the natural environment. Yeah, and I'll even I mean. T- I know you want to talk about corals next, so this is a good lead in. No, is, this is great. This is great. You're killing it, bro. Your your Solomon Islands dive videos where you shore dive, those are some of the best videos because you go from like a shallow environment into a deeper environment and you're narrating it and you're talking about your experiences. Like that was a great I've watched that video like 30 times, you know? Um it's it's a great it's relaxing too to watch you know um you have a very relaxing tone in the video <laughs> so uh, well I learned it through reef therapy <laughs> and this awesome microphone <laughs> No it was a lot it was way before then but yeah, yeah that might have been a, a while back yeah. just you know just trying to take people do do my best uh David Attenborough It was uh, good it was impression good. I highly recommend oh, uh folks pull that one up so um, yeah, we haven't even started talking about corals, but like now I'm just like logging to go diving so bad. Um, I, and like I said, I think we could talk about fish for some, for a lot longer, but let's talk about the corals. Yeah. And the biggest thing you'll, you'll notice when you go diving is how much bigger the corals are. The elegance corals aren't bigger. The trachophilias aren't bigger. The cyclos aren't big, are not bigger. I'm trying to think of what else isn't. The torch corals are probably a lot smaller. I've never seen a field of torch corals. But like everything else is massive. Sometimes you're you're literally talking about an acre of being one coral. That's yeah. that's an extreme. But when you see some of our staghorn corals and the colony is half a story tall, you can a human can almost swim through it like it was a pygmy angelfish. You know, that's the kind of scale we're talking about. And again, it really depends on the the environment. In some places, um, there's really a big difference between old and new reefs, right? When you see a coral reef, you think that it's just always been there. But with with bleaching and other environmental events and especially storms and cyclones, reefs have to start over. Like yeah. a, a really diverse reef, just like a rainforest, it has to start over every three to ten years, right? In some place that's real in a path of, of storms. And when the reef is new, you'll have huge diversity of small corals. And when a coral's been left alone and untouched for a long time, it's much fewer corals. And every coral is like two to three feet across. And, you know, if that coral reef environment hasn't experienced any um, disruption or disturbances, it's one coral, just like a forest. On a long enough timeline, one coral dominates exactly like your reef tank. I was about to say that last part. Yeah. On a long enough timeline, if you did nothing to your reef tank, you'd be left with two or three corals. Doesn't matter what type, but whoever's dominant, and it it will vary from tank to tank on whoever is thriving the most, on whoever just had the upper hand when when two plating corals just got close and just one went up and the other went down. You know, that's not even like a rhyme or reason. Sometimes it's really chance. And so there really is a difference between a kind of a an old reef that's not been disturbed. You'll see great coral cover and usually kind of crummy coral diversity. But the coral reefs that get disturbed, you know, periodically have the most diversity of corals, but they're going to be smaller for sure. Yeah, when we um, when we did that Cozumel trip, I remember them talking about uh, the hurricane damage. Cause so so there was a hurricane that went through there and destroyed a lot of the reef. And uh, we were coming in, I'd say about 24 months, maybe three years later. And uh, one of the things that we were sort of helping to look at was um, that recolonization, right? And there was a lot of talk about pioneer species, right? And you talk about like a forest fire, there's certain plants that show up first. 
And then they sort of build the habitat for other organisms to show up. And it was interesting because I remember them talking about pioneer species um, after hurricane damage. And I've never really heard anybody else talk about it like that, like like more like a terrestrial ecosystem that's been disturbed by a forest fire. And to your point, yeah, there's it's it's like a fresh substrate for larvae to colonize, right? So you're going to see a higher grade of diversity. And as the coral cover increases, there's less surface area for a coral plankton larvae to, to, to colonize. Um, so as, as the reef gets older in a more stable environment, and, and this brings up something you brought up about the Red Sea and stuff is coral diversity is a little less there, but maybe that's attributed to just a higher level of stability right? In those environments, there's less of that. Um, I think we call it in biology, a founder's effect, right? Where you kind of knock everything down. Um, I don't know. It's a, it's a good point. You know, Indonesia has currents coming from the Indian Ocean, from the Pacific Ocean. It has a massive influx of plankton from multiple locations. And it has it has um, a lot of terrigenous input, which yes. is basically like feeding your tank nitrates and phosphorus. Yeah. Right? All those particles coming from the forest, that's driving the ecosystem system. That's driving the growth of the hydroids and the bryozoans that makes you feel icky when you come out. <laughs> Yeah. So, so you know, you know, we're, we're we're both kind of discovering on this journey through reef therapy and our long reef aquarium career that our tanks have been too clean for way, 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 way too long. You know, my my tanks after dosing phosphates for a couple months, I'm still trying to figure out, find out that sweet spot. They have never looked better. But one thing I really want to put out there, and if you get nothing else from this session of reef therapy. And if you've made it this far, or this is going to be one of our longest, <laughs> yeah. um, corals in the wild are kind of fucked up. <laughs> I, 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 you know, we, we, we allow ourselves a, you know, a one or two curse words to keep it mostly PG or I guess that'd be PG 13. Um, but I always describe it as 25% of the corals on, I'm, I'm just super generalizing, right? 25% of the corals, they get an A plus. They are killing it. Almost none of our corals look as good as uh, in the shallow water corals, right? Stylos, acros, 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 <laughs> you know, the shallow water stuff. Usually that stuff is at 25%. Uh, 25% of it is like freaking awesome. Uh, give those an A plus grade. And then like 50% of it, you know, our reef tanks are kind of comparable. You know, some corals look better, some look, corals look worse, um, and then the other twenty five percent gets is a D D minus. The tw a good quarter of the corals on an average reef is like struggling or suffering because they can't pick their spot in the reef tank. Right? We can move corals around. We can put them where we want. We can move them again later and find that sweet spot. But corals, you know, they have. Um, there's a certain instinct and certain feedback that kind of encourages them to grow in certain places. But like you said, I think this is re re relative to founder's effect. Sometimes they land in the wrong spot. Sometimes they land underneath another coral. And sometimes that's actually great, right? So you can find what would be more of a deep water acro species growing underneath a big table acro in 20 feet, that suharsonoi would never grow in, in 20 feet if it was in direct sunlight. Um, and then sometimes it's just, you know, it's in a hole or it's upside down or it's too deep or it's too shallow or it's too close to the sand, <laughs> you know, or it literally landed on sand and it's just doing its best to try to be a sand coral, right? So we trend, we tend to think of the natural environment as the be all end all, right? It's natural. That's the way it's supposed to be. But you know anything about, you know, survival of the fittest, that's happening on the reef, right? There's predators, there's competition, there's uh, pressure from the environment. And uh, yeah, 25% of the corals look better than our tanks. Half of them pretty comparable. And then a qu another quarter never look as good as they do in our aquariums. And 
there is, if you can really dial in, you know, a tank for Euphelias or for Ghanis or a mixed reef or, you'll, unlike, except for deep water acros, you're never going to match the wild, right? Like those super shallow water Fiji or Australian corals. Hey, it's going to be a lifelong pursuit to try to get them as hot as when they were first imported in. Right, but for some other corals, uh, chalices and a lot of LPSs and mid and deep water corals, um, our reef tanks, those corals look way better, way, way, way better because they don't have the pressure because we're putting them in a bubble, right? So I just want people to understand, like on the reef, it is not all you know unicorns and rainbows. It no, is a kill point. or be killed. I mean, so I think. I, the word I was looking for wasn't founder's effect, but I don't know what the word is because founder's effect is when a catastrophic event reduces genetic diversity, whereas we're more talking about a catastrophic event long-term increasing genetic diversity because there's niches to fill again, right, to refill. Um, but to your point about a coral as a plankton larvae, finding a suitable substrate to settle on, right, it's it's – to go from that and derive out of that to say, well, this Samacor is growing here, so this is the environment that we should replicate in our environment or in our aquariums, is that's like a bit of a reach, right? Because this this larvae decided to settle somewhere and go, I think this will do, but sometimes luck of the draw, it ends up in a crappy environment and goes, well, shit, I just got to do my best here, you know? Not sometimes, most of right. the time. Yeah. 99% of the time, right? Same as the fish, same as every ecosystem. It's survival. 99 plus 0.9999% of the offsprings, you know, don't make it, right? It is completely luck of the draw if a coral is going to be in a really optimal location. They have some, you know, internal feedback to help guide them to the shallow reef or a deeper reef or a cooler reef or when it's more calm or when it's more wave washed. But 99% of everything will die before it has a chance to reproduce, right? That is why this planet is not, you know, the hundred miles thick with living things because we have to eat each other and you don't survive everywhere. And so once again, with this fetishization of stability, people always think that the coral is always going to look better in nature. And that's just simply not true. They, that is one of the most astounding things. Okay. The shallow water acros, very hard to match, right? Cause you need so much light and so much flow. It's like driving a race car really, really, really fast. It's hard to, in our aquariums to keep things on track, but, uh, in the wild, oh my goodness. Yeah. Most of the corals are getting stung by hydroids or getting, you know, predated on by a, a parrotfish or, um, getting stung by a neighbor. Like it, all these things, these pressures are always there. Yeah. Coral warfare is a real thing, right? We've seen it in our aquariums. It just doesn't just happen in our aquariums. I mean, how many times does a coral settle out and like, hey, right now, right at this moment, this environment's really good. And then some seasonality hits and maybe during winter, it's the North Shore of Hawaii or something. And it's like, oh, this was not a good place to settle, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a good point. I mean, it, <sighs> replicating nature, one, is impossible. And then two, um, you know, we talked about flow, like... Uh, the, there's no way you'll ever replicate the flow of a reef in Cozumel, um, for example. And that's not the only drift dive in the world. I'm just the one that I can directly reference because I've been there. But, but at the end of the day, our corals do tend to do all right, you know, in our tanks. And maybe our success is better guided in like what you said of like mimicking, I don't want to call Indonesia dirty, but like a, more of a dirtier reef, like a little more something in between a very dynamic yeah. environment where the tides come in and out and the temperature changes, you know, six degrees twice a day. And one that is a complete bubble, like the Red Sea or the Maldives, where everything is just super stable, you know, so something in between is going to be much, much better. Yeah. Much better. You know, and you know, people also talk about what the coral should look like in the wild. I never see no wild corals as bright as our aquarium corals. No. It's just yeah. not even close. It's not just about the lighting. It's like we are 
conditioning them and looking after them and giving them everything they want mineral wise with no competition, with no grazing, with no predation, with all the amino acids, with all the trace elements that they could ever want with target feeding. You know, I don't think you're ever going to see like dendros as, you know, when someone's really looking after them just as fat and puffy and happy in the wild. I've never actually actually seen them in the wild, um, as you see in a dedicated NPS aquarium. And so same thing with morphology. Sometimes a coral will be so big that it might, you know, range from like 10 feet deep to 25 deep and be like 20 to 30 feet across. And the coral looks in the same colony looks incredibly different in the shallows to the mids to the edges of the coral colony. You know, I think one really good example of how corals look really different in the wild and in our aquariums is a lot of these encrusting monoporas, right? You have um, monopora undata, monopora confusa, monopora vietnamensis. These corals aren't encrusting in the wild. They're freaking branching, but they have to reach a critical mass to for do you that. to enjoy yeah. those those large branches. You know, crack open a, a copy of Corals of the World right here and look at the pictures of some of these so-called encrusting corals, right? You know, I think, um, you know, uh, Chris Capp's Jedi Mind Trick is like over three feet across and it is like a, a scape on its own and you've got these ridges and these mountains and these edges and it's it's just so different from the center of the colony to the edge at uh, only three feet across so you imagine you go to the wild you know i have a nice colony of montreport confusa that is really like starting to spread and uh kind of crowd some of my more precious acros and i'm like kind of torn i was like mm, do i trim it back and but i want that coral to really thrive and start throwing up those uh mature branches that, that, that spike up and they have colored tips. You know, I have a, a 12 inch, 14 inch colony of monopore undata, you know, the classic one. And only on one edge is it growing really fast. And it's got one of those branches coming up with a nice, just solid pink edge. You know, Steve, Steve Herlock, he used to have a big colony of undata that had just nothing but branches. But if you're just a reefer and you only look at the aquarium documentation, you would never know that. Yeah. You would never know that Confusa and Vietnamensis and Undata is a branching monopora. Like if, you know, right, you could take frags of these corals in the wild and, and glue them down and people would not even recognize them for the species. They'd be like, that looks kind of familiar, but <laughs> never seen it do that. Acros, they, you know, they stick to the script pretty good. Right. But definitely there's if you have a copy of Corals of the World, crack it open and look at some of these colonies that just don't resemble anything that, you know, because there's a lot of frags in the aquarium hobby of those corals that just need to grow larger and more mature to show you the next dimension of what they can do. And this is definitely something that we're missing in the in the reef aquarium hobby. It's not just about bragging rights. And having that huge coral, you know, for sure, there's plenty of corals that just aren't going to change, right? A Ghani isn't really going to change as it grows larger. Some of the alveopores, I mean, there's a lot of branching species of Ghanis and alves that we just don't let them get big enough, right? But there's a lot of branching species of those guys. I mean, like a good third, I think there's a huge section in corals of the world where very literally uh, – classifies it or groups it as branching Ghanis or branching alves, And we're just, we're just totally missing all that. Um, so yeah, you're not going to, you know, see a huge difference with the Ghanis. I'm literally looking around and, you know, Cyphastria is mostly amorphous, but yeah, there's groups of corals that we're missing the next dimension of morphology of what that coral can do simply because we're all fixated on, you know, little genetic samples. It's, you know, it's funny as you were saying that I was thinking about, um, you know, are my preferences for having less number of corals, but larger colonies in a tank rooted in get off my lawn. That's how we used to do it back in the day. But really, I think back in the day, what we were chasing was a, a wilder thing, a more natural thing, right? So I think in because the end- Because that's all we had to go off of. Right. And so- right? I, That's all we had to go off of. And now people who are really insulated in their online environments- 
they mostly are, are being their frame of presented. reference is Instagram, right? Whereas us, it was books Instagram with Instagram, um, pictures Nielsen of saying, other reef tanks. Here's a reef crest, and here's a lagoon, and blah blah blah. And and it's probably why I don't like tanks that are just you know 500 different genetic samples all grouped together. I love seeing a tank. With a massive turbine area, you know, taking up a quarter of the tank, which you, you rarely see anymore, right? And that's hard to do because, you know, it's rather boring keeping five corals. But those are the tanks that really wow me. And so, I, in the end, it's not so much as trying to be old school. I think it's just old school meant we were excited by what we saw through our snorkel or scuba mask. And that's what we were trying to create in a, in a house, right? In a glass box inside of a house. I feel like this is an awesome note to start wrapping things up because mm -hmm. we're circling back to the splice, the, the rainbow splice, Acapora millipora. If you, if you grow out, you know, certain strains of corals, especially Montes um, that I discussed earlier, you're going to have a much more rare coral in your aquarium. One that is mature and showing this extra dimension, this extra but, you know, growth that you'll never, ever see. What do you always hear people complaining about encrusting Montes that they take over the tank? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, they yeah. don't want to have one giant colony of it, right? But it's funny that the the thing that we're preaching is the thing that they hate about those corals. You know, anyway. No. Oh, you're no, you're right. You're absolutely right. But yeah, you know, if you if you don't want to stomach the price of uh whatever, a thousand dollar coral, just put in the time. Put in the time to grow and develop a more mature version of very common corals. Like Monopora undata is so common, you might be hard pressed to find it at a reef show because the vendors think that nobody wants it. But when you get that thing super colored up, you know, jade color with, you know, basically bright white polyps and a, you know, crazy purple edge. What I mean, that is as good as it gets. Yeah. <laughs> that is as good as it gets, really. No, I agree. Um, cool. Well, on that note, I would like to inform our viewers and our listeners that um, Mark and I are planning after one year of mostly solo sessions of re-therapy, going to start inviting some very distinguished guests to join us in our sessions to make us all feel better about everything. And um, one of the ones that is uh, lining up is we're going to be uh, hosting Jeff Sensky of the Quorum Design Group, and we're going to be yelling at the clouds for the entire episode. <laughs> you know, we really kind of hold back and try to have a mostly constructive conversation and discussion on reef therapy, but just for our own sanity, uh, we want to bitch and complain. <laughs> we want to bitch and complain about just certain things. That if, you, if, you're, if you're PC all the time, there's this baseline that just keeps moving and keeps moving and just making things worse. Right. So if you have any thoughts on uh, certain infractions committed by manufacturers, right, we're, we're basically going to be calling out manufacturers and vendors on um, things that we haven't covered yet. Um, definitely let us know in the comments, you know, some of the things that you think uh, we should cover in our get off my lawn yelling at the cloud episode. It will not be a constructive conversation whatsoever it might be a little bit you know in the sense it might of, move the needle for yeah. a handful of embarrassed brands but uh yeah we just need to get this out of our system and then we'll get back to you know just talking about more constructive uh reef conversations um afterwards but uh mark this is uh, i think this is our longest session to date crack yeah, two hour two mark hours. i don't know if we've ever done that Somebody out yeah. there is going to listen yeah, to this. Plus the sponsor message and, uh, at the beginning. I mean, an hour in, they're going to be done with their water changes, and they've cleaned the glass, they've cleaned the skimmer, <laughs> and they're like, these guys are still talking. <laughs> so, Oh, no, these guys are just warming up. <laughs> yeah. These guys are just warming up. So we want to thank everyone who's made it all this way. 
And bonus points if you made it all this way without pausing. Um, thanks for joining us on this uh, session of reef therapy. We've really enjoyed um, comparing the natural environment to our reef tanks. And uh, we'll see you again on another session very soon. Sounds good to me. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>